Greetings, stranger. We are going to watch today the origin and history of the Germans. I am the German. Where do we come from? Where do I come from? I, I hope I know. Otherwise, this will be embarrassing. Let's go. How many times did the Germans take control of Europe? You may be Never. twice, right? World War One and Two. Maybe three times if you're a real memer. But some might be surprised to know that long, long before this, over a thousand years ago, Germans, or rather Germanic tribes, were plundering and raiding their way across the entire continent of Europe and even parts of Asia and Barbarians, Africa. Barbarians, they are called. Unprecedented expanse of land for the time. Well, the country of Germany didn't just come into existence overnight, and up until relatively recently, actually, there wasn't even really a unified German nation or ethnicity or even language for that matter. Yeah, that's true, actually. Germany was one of the last countries in Europe to form a country. There were, like, sprinkled kingdoms all over, but no country. And the same thing can even be said today. But over time, the socio-political landscapes have gone through radical transformations. But whatever happened to these Germanic tribes and empires that existed so many centuries ago? And did they, more or less, evolve into the modern Germanic nations of Europe that we would recognize today? The situation, as with most historical processes of ethnogenesis, is quite complicated. Contrary to what the name would imply, the Germanic languages originated not in Germany, but in Scandinavia to the north, and as the northernmost really? branch of the Indo-European family, there's strong evidence that they interacted with and were heavily influenced by and influenced the neighboring Finno-Ugrians in both culture, language, and religion. Not much is known about the Proto-Germanic people <laughs> Look at the horse. in Scandinavia, although they would have started settling in continental Europe, or what is modern-day Denmark and Germany, around 1000 BC, slowly spreading out over the North Sea and Baltic Sea regions, and eventually split into the two subdivisions of North and South Germanic, with the northern mm -hmm. varieties evolving into the Scandinavian languages such as Swedish, Danish, and Norwegian, while the southern colonists on the shores of Europe would eventually turn into the continental Germanic peoples we think of today, but of course not in the blink of an eye. The continental Germans were divided between many different groups and tribes, each with their own culture, language, and lore, with groups like the Goths or Vandals and their descendants settling in what is now modern-day Eastern Germany and Poland, being the easternmost branch of those in the south, while in the west you would have groups like the Franks rise to prominence. More on that later. Before the further southern expansion of these Germanic... I didn't know that. Southern expansion? So that's why I look so Swedish. I am Swedish. We just which brothers from a different father. ...peoples into the heart Mother. of Europe. Much of this region was believed to have been inhabited by ancient Celtic peoples who used to be spread out over nearly all of Western and Central Europe, with the Alpine region of Southern Germany, Switzerland, and Austria being the epicenter of the Celtic expansion. And it's also been heavily speculated that the Italic branch split from this early Celtic homeland. Many of the invading Germanic tribes would conquer and assimilate these ancient Celtic nations. And in fact, many in Austria, Bavaria, and Switzerland today have many Celtic traditions that have survived through the ages and may consider themselves to have some affinity with the ancient Celts, seeing how... Okay, but what are the traditions? You should at least say what traditions. ...was their original homeland. In combination with the Roman push from the south, this would eventually drive these continental Celts into extinction with the only surviving branch being those in the British Isles. And as most are aware, Germanic peoples were a constant threat to Rome's northern territorial integrity, frequently raiding northern provinces. As we discussed in the previous video, the invasion of the Huns had a major indirect impact on European demography, as during the 4th and 5th centuries, during their pillaging and devastation of Eastern Europe, they became shaky allies with many of the Eastern Germanic peoples, such as the Ostrogoths, essentially strong-arming them into their forces since annihilation was the only alternative. Although Who was that? Them Who is that? Is it a white chick riding with them? Oh no, she's a captive. <laughs> Okay. ...them into their forces since annihilation was the only alternative. Although many Germanic peoples in this region did end up fleeing into Roman territory, which would cause a whole host of issues. Even after the Huns were disbanded and massacred by Germanic and Roman troops in Eastern Europe, 
many marauding Germanic peoples were rampaging through Western and Eastern Roman halves, with the Vandals making their way to Iberia in North Africa, the Visigoths in Italy and the Balkans, the Ostrogoths in Iberia and France, and many smaller groups such as the Burgundians, Suebi, or Lombards settling elsewhere. Additionally, you also had a very large Nordic presence throughout most of Europe, especially Russia, with the first prince of the Kievan Rus, Oleg of Novgorod, being of Varangian or Nordic origin, although we'll have to save the history of the Vikings and their impact on Europe for another day. But taking all this into account, there's hardly a region of Europe where Germanic tribes hadn't conquered or at least invaded, from the Balkans to Iberia to Russia, even Anatolia and the Maghreb. However, in Italy, Iberia, and the Balkans, these Germanic rulers were eventually ousted one way or another, and the remaining settlements were mostly absorbed into the prevailing population and influenced them in very unique ways. For instance, in northern Spain, many of the remaining Germanic kings banded together once the peninsula was invaded and conquered by the Islamic Moors, having quite a large impact on early Castilian customs and culture. And today in Spain, four out of the ten most common surnames in the country Fernandez, Gonzalez, Rodriguez, and Gomez are of Germanic origin. What? Fernandez? That doesn't sound German. Rodriguez is like the least German name you can think of. What was the origin name? Hmm. Gonzalez? The Anglo-Saxons are, of course, descended from a plethora of Germanic tribes invading from the North Sea region, specifically the Angles, Jutes, and Saxons, with Old English, not Middle English, which is the language most people think of when they think of Old English, but actual Old English being completely unintelligible for modern English speakers, due to the fact that the English language was heavily impacted by Latin and Norman from the French invasion centuries later and Old English was actually most similar to the modern Frisian language found in Germany and the Netherlands. By and large though, one of the most impressive Germanic tribes would have been the Franks or Franconian peoples in what Northern is Gaul. this map? Frankish territory, Austrasia. Oh my God, these maps are so weird. What? Conquered this region and much of what is now that just shows how much changed in a couple of hundred years or a thousand years. Like, now Germany and Northern Italy eventually splitting into three kingdoms with the Western Kingdom of West Francia eventually just becoming the Kingdom of France. The old Frankish language, which was Germanic in origin, did persist among the upper class of the French population for quite some time. So you're saying French originated German? That cannot be true. Although it was eventually completely replaced by the Latin-based French tongue, albeit with heavy Germanic influence. And the other Franconian dialects were still spoken throughout East Francia, with the closest language to Old Frankish spoken in France being Luxembourgish. Speaking of East Francia, this is what would evolve into the first German kingdom, which was also part of the Holy Roman Empire. It's extremely complicated. Was the Holy yeah, Roman sounds Empire very complicated. the German Empire? Technically, no. The Holy Roman Empire was essentially an alliance of smaller kingdoms, fiefdoms, and vassals, and existed contemporaneously with the German kingdom, mostly centered on Germany and only maintaining control over Rome for a relatively short time. Look, that's where I'm from, guys. Look, here. And now I live here. Where's Berlin? Huh? Where's Berlin? Here. It doesn't even exist on the map yet. The hell? For time, although Latin and Roman Catholicism remained the de facto administrative language and religion of this conglomerate. Under the Holy Roman Empire, there was massive expansion of the German realm in so Europe, ups. with German settlers arriving in what is now East Germany and Poland where they displaced and assimilated many of the Slavic natives known as Vens, with the surviving Slavic tribes of Eastern Germany becoming the Sorbs or Lusatians. And they also conquered a Baltic-speaking people who were the original Prussians, establishing the city of Königsberg. As I discussed in a past video, genetic studies have proven that Eastern Germans on the border with Poland, or Austrians in the Northeast, have a moderately high degree of admixture from Slavic Eastern Europeans, as evidenced by the presence of haplogroup R1A, which no isn't exclusively. 
Well, it makes sense, logically, that they would be more Slavic. But the looks, they don't agree. They don't look Slavic because women in East Germany are less beautiful than women in West Germany. <laughs> And Slavic women are very beautiful. So, logic issue. I shouldn't have said that, but I did. And I, I am not taking it back. Really Slavic, but in this context and region is very heavily correlated with Slavic speakers such as Poles, Czechs, Russians, Ukrainians, as well as the remaining Lusatians in Saxony. Throughout the centuries, many of these diverse German tribes would see a shared heritage and affinity with the other continental Germanic peoples, and slowly a common identity began to form among them, as the name German itself is an exonym branded on them by the Romans from thousands of years ago, and it wasn't until well after the fall of the Romans that they would start to form any coherent ethnic solidarity. In fact, back in the late 18th century, there wasn't even really a German language, as it wasn't until the 19th century that the modern German language, or Hochdeutsch, became standardized across Prussia, Austria, and Switzerland, although many regions maintained their own unique dialects for centuries, which is why you still have the high Oh my god, that's so many dialects. West-Niederdeutsch, West-Mitteldeutsch, Ost-Mitteldeutsch. We don't use that anymore. They're Schwäbisch, that we still use. Frankish, yes. Brandenburgish. Do we say that? I'm not sure. ...of linguistic diversity in the German Sprachraum, or language area to this day, which consists of Germany, Austria, Liechtenstein, most of Switzerland, South Tyrol and Italy... What do you mean, Liechtenstein? Germany, Austria, Liechtenstein... That's Switzerland. Liechtenstein is... Super small, it's like one town here. Or maybe it was bigger before, but that can't be. Most of Switzerland, South Tyrol. I think they just screwed something up here with the, with the map. Italy, Alsace, Lorraine, and France, a small sliver of eastern Belgium, and arguably Luxembourg as well. By the way, the Dutch language is technically also a part of the continental. There's Liechtenstein, this, look. These maps are so confusing because they're not from today, but from hundreds of years ago. Although the standardized version is quite distinct from Hochdeutsch, to say the least. Although those who speak regional dialects on the border of Germany and the Netherlands can understand each other. This is very similar to the Italians, who were also divided between countless different nations who spoke extremely divergent languages yet in the 19th century went through the process of ethnogenesis that led to the modern nation of Italy forming, even though many people still speak their own regional dialects in that country as well. Other than the modern Germans, Austrians, Swiss, Alsatians, and South Tyrolians, there are many German subgroups that have developed independently, the majority of whom were located in Eastern Europe before World War II and the mass repatriation of over 10 million ethnic Germans from Poland, the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, and elsewhere. The Anabaptists are perhaps one of the most interesting examples of a unique German subgroup. You'd know them better as the Amish, who are descended from Swiss Anabaptists and settled mostly in Pennsylvania. In the, the Amish are Swiss? What? <laughs> that blows my mind. I didn't know that. The American Midwest and the Mennonites, who are descended from Russian Anabaptists and are actually what? scattered to West. And the Mennonites, who are descended from Russian Anabaptists and are actually scattered throughout the American continents, especially Latin America, interestingly enough. Lord They're Russian spies. In the States. Actually keeping to their own communities, these people How are can well you known for their tolerate that? religious piety and shunning of technology in the modern world, speaking unique dialects Just with kidding. Pennsylvania German or Deutsch spoken among the Amish. Pennsylvania Swiss German Latonian dialect. And Plautdeutsch, mm. spoken among the Mennonites, a Dutch-influenced Prussian dialect. The German diaspora worldwide is, of course, in the tens of millions of people. As I've discussed quite a few times, with there being large German enclaves around the world on almost every continent. But due to intermixing with other ethnic groups, the exact number is a bit difficult to enumerate. But German descendants have gained much prominence and influence not only in Canada and the United States and Northern America, but also Chile, Argentina, and Brazil of the Southern Cone in South America.
Yeah, especially in South America, you will find a lot of uh, Nazis <laughs> who escaped uh, after or during the World War II and they are living there happily ever after because the bad guys went retiring in Argentina. In Europe, outside of the remnant German communities in Eastern Europe and on the fringes of France and Italy, there are more recent German migrant communities in the United Kingdom, Spain, especially the Canary Islands and other retirement destinations, as well as Portugal, Greece, or Scandinavia, and have done a pretty good job of reversing their image from the past, from raiders and conquerors to a leading economic power in Europe. So go ahead and let me know your thoughts on the old Germanic peoples and the forming of the modern nation of Germany today and their descendants. And for today's poll, let me know which German subgroup you find the most interesting and want to learn more about. And as always, thanks for watching, everyone. Wow, this video was super interesting, but it was a lot of information. Jesus Christ, uh, we have to find out more about this Pennsylvania Germans. And we need to find some videos spoken in those colonies around the world, like this German settlement. That would be very interesting to hear. But this will be the matter for a different video, which we will do in the coming week. Until then.